Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the second day of our conference. And I'm going to chair this uh, session. It's our honor and our pleasure to have Professor Arthur Wolf here. And I guess you all know that um, Professor Arthur Wolf was one of the anthropologists uh, who came to Taiwan in 1960 to study folk religion in Taiwan. And in 1974, he added the book um, Religion and Ritual in Chinese Society. Since then, his article in that book, God, Ghost, and Ancestors, has become the uh, classic reading for students who want to study folk religion in Taiwan or even uh, want to study Chinese religion. And today, uh, he is going to share, us, share his uh, experience with us uh, in doing uh, folk religion in Taiwan. So let's welcome Professor Arthur Wolf. Let me, first of all, uh, one reason I agreed to do this is to give me the opportunity to publicly thank Zhang Shun for translating that article. Uh, I frankly, you know, if she had not done that, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, the article has, you know, as those of you who were here yesterday, attained a certain, perhaps we should call it notoriety. Uh, there's a, a certain amount of agreement, disagreement with it, not surprisingly. It's also actually fairly well known among uh, anthropologists and students of Chinese studies in the United States. I occasionally meet somebody. Uh, it was written a long time ago. I recently met a young man in, who had read it as a student, and he looked at me, and he quite not realized that I was still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted to know if I was a god, a ghost, or an ancestor. <laughs> uh, so that is it's sort of the text for this morning. Let me say, first of all, that uh, when the organizers, uh, well, I asked them if I, being that I was in Taiwan, if I could join, attend this, uh, this conference. And then they wanted me to give a, what they call a keynote address. Let me then explicitly say, this is not a keynote address. This is a footnote address. <laughs> no, no more. Uh, perhaps uh, to understand my probably not too obvious attitude in that article, but why I wrote it and why I didn't go on to write much more in that vein, uh, the article is not known among anthropologists in general. Chinese studies, yes, not anthropologists in general. If Arthur Wolf, insofar as he is a known among anthropologists, it's for studies of incest avoidance, uh, nothing to do with, uh, with Chinese religion. My background is, is relevant. Uh, I come from a, you know, certainly not a family of academics. I was the only person in my family uh, who ever completed high school, uh, let alone went on to university. Uh, I grew up in a family of loggers and ranchers. Uh, I worked my way through college as a logger and in gold mines in Alaska. So I have a certain redneck background. That's why I wear a tie, you see, it uh, disguises it. Uh, but one of the interesting and relevant aspect of that background is for reasons, frankly, that I really don't understand. There was no religion there at all. Uh, you know, it wasn't that people were atheists or anything. It's just that they didn't pay any attention. Uh, and I wasn't inside of a church until I was about 24 years of age. And that's only because a friend got married there. And I should confess, I haven't been back. Uh, it, religion was just something not that was part of my background. Religion, in some sense, in so far as it, you know, uh, was noted at all, was something it 
We lived in a, my family in a rural area. This was something people in the towns did. <laughs> and they did all kinds of strange things. Uh, I mean, they, they went out and actually paid money to take sticks and beat little, you know, white balls around on the grass. They wouldn't know how to skin a pig, let alone a deer, uh, and so forth. And probably the greatest culture shock that I've experienced in my life was not coming uh, to Taiwan and going to live in a Taiwanese village, but it was going to a high school in the town and finding out that they were healthy, apparently uh, mentally balanced young people my own age who actually believed in some aspects of Christianity and even went to church. It was just, it was a shock. Uh, and that is always there in the background. And then I you know, went on to college and I studied a certain amount of philosophy and so forth and that added sort of the intellectual underpinning, but it wasn't there, it wasn't part of my, of my childhood. So I certainly didn't come uh, to Taiwan to study religion. Uh, Remember, when I came here, I was the second American. The first three of us were all from Cornell University. First was Bernard Gallen, I was second. Norma Diamond was third. Uh, just a, a, a footnote to Chinese anthropology in the United States. It was created, I think, essentially by a man that most of you, few of you might have heard of, but most have not. A man by the name of Lauriston Sharp. Uh, if you've heard of him, it's because the article was once really almost required reading in American undergraduate courses in anthropology called Steel Axes for Stone Age Australians. Uh, Lauriston Sharp was a specialist in uh, native peoples of Australia. He was one of the uh, first anthropologists to do work uh, there back in early 1930s. At any rate, Sharp was a man with a certain amount of vision. And he saw that, you know, at the time that I started graduate school, they were basically, there was Francis L. K. Xu, and there was Morton Fried, the United States, and Morris Friedman, not a fairly young man then in England, that was Chinese anthropology. And Sharp saw that uh, China was somewhat more important than that. Uh, that there were more American anthropologists studying the Navajo than were studying China. And so Sharp rather systematically went by picking out students who, you know, he didn't push them, but he, you know, given an opportunity and a suggestion, he put four people in the China field. The first was G. William Skinner. Uh, uh, Bernie Gallen was the second, I was the third, and Norma Diamond the fourth. And that was sort of the, the basis of American anthropology and Chinese studies for quite a long time. At any rate, moving on, what did I come to Taiwan to do? I came to Taiwan as a, the seventh member uh, of what was called the Six Culture Project. Not, I think, probably something uh, familiar to anyone in this room. But it was an effort uh, by three uh, senior American social scientists, uh, William W. Lambert, one of my teachers, a psychologist at Cornell, John W. M. Whiting, a quite famous anthropologist at Harvard, and a man by the name of Irvin Child, a child psychologist at Yale, to do a systematic uh, cross-cultural study of children's behavior. Uh, and a manual was prepared, and an observation schedule sent out, questionnaires written, et cetera. And field teams, typically man and wife, uh, went to uh, Gusi in uh, East Africa, uh, to a, a, Punj a village in, uh, a Sikh village in North India, to Okinawa, uh, to a village in uh, the Northern Philippines, and to Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, and collected data under a schedule of so many observations, looking particularly of how children responded to certain very concrete situations, like another child hits them, another child hurts them, uh, another child hits them, another child gets hurt in their presence, that kind of thing. 
At any rate, I came to Taiwan with the intention uh, of uh, replicating that study uh, in, a, in a Chinese community. And I spent uh, approximately a little over two and a half years doing that. Quantitative observations of children's behavior are, they're very time consuming, et cetera. And I just want to mention one sort of finding. One of my, you know, things that I feel guilty about and hope that uh, I will do something about in the fairly new feature is I've never gotten that material written up. It's, it's a massive amount of material. The child observations are alone, about 1,200 single space pages. Uh, and it wasn't just the observations, all the children and the mothers were interviewed. There were what we call thematic apperception tests, giving the children pictures and asking them to tell a story about it. There were doll play sessions, giving children a house and some dolls and ask them to do it and tell a story, et cetera. It's a rather massive amount of material. So massive that when I returned to Cornell, I, unlike any other of the field teams, one of the reasons of coming from the background I do, a rancher and so forth, you get to be stubborn. Uh, you know, you don't work in the woods. Uh, you don't deal with big animals without getting to develop a certain amount of stubbornness. And I came out to Taiwan determined I was going to complete that schedule. And, quite proud still of the fact that I did. Most of the other field teams, while they got a lot of data, didn't actually complete the schedule. Any rate, one of the major tasks that remains for me uh, is to write up that material. It's more important now than it was then, because nobody will ever go back to a Chinese or Taiwanese village of that kind. Uh, you know, this was in 1957. Uh, Families were largely extended families. There were, you know, fire walkings regularly for the gods. Uh, you know, people were a lot better off than they were in mainland of China uh, in the 1920s or 30s. But still, one would have to say that a large amount of most of traditional social structure was still there. It was all about to change, but nobody, of course, knew that. Uh, it's amazing that uh, the children I studied, one is now a uh, uh, TV talk show producer, another married a German sinologist and lives in Munich. Uh, and so it's <laughs> quite, uh, you know, but they didn't see that coming. Of course, I didn't uh, either. One finding, though, because it, it, in a sense, I hope, will give some support to a point I will make a bit later. One of the variables that the Six Culture focused on was children's uh, response to aggression. And one of the measures uh, you can develop out of the child observations is how frequently do children hit back when hit, how frequently do they curse back when cursed by other children, etc. And, and Two points about this. We both observe, I both observed the children and I asked them what they would do. Uh, and the questions, the interview was both individual with the children in the village, but I also administered it in a written form in the local schools to the later grades. I had the greatest difficulty to get the children to admit that they would, under any circumstances, ever hit back. Uh, finally had to put in extreme sort of situations. Suppose you were walking to school and a kid you didn't know came up and grabbed your books and threw them in the paddy field and when you went, leaned over to pick them up, he pushed you in after them. What would you do? And the possibilities were, you know, I'd hit him, I'd curse him, I'd tell his mother, I'd tell my mother, I'd do nothing. The children in the school, they, they would shake their fists, but they won't shake, do nothing took the same questionnaire to a school in my native town in Northern California, came to this question, a little boy raised his hand and said, can I add something? What would you want to add? I'd kill him. <laughs> but the fact is when you look at the children's actual behavior, the Chinese children were just probably a little bit more likely to hit back than the Americans. <laughs> 
There was a very different, some people would call it culture, in the two communities, but it didn't have much effect on behavior. Enormous individual variation. There were some children who never hit back, and there were some hot kids that, you know, they hit back every time, almost. But population variation, the averages across the seven cultures, my data included, the average time that children will give aggression back in kind varies from 31% of the time to 33% of the time. Communities as different as East Africa, Brockton, Massachusetts, and Taiwan. No variation at the population or quote unquote cultural level, lots of variation at the individual level. That, you know, that finding is something that uh, had an effect, uh, certainly on my entire view of the world. All right. Why did, given this was my purpose and given that this is what I devoted most of my time to do, did I ever collect enough material uh, to write the paper the, that is sort of the topic of this morning's discussion? And basically the answer is that coming from the background I did, basically hostile toward religion, uh, I found Chinese folk religion very attractive. There was no ideology. There was nobody telling you what to do. There was no insistence that you go to church. Uh, the, the child observations, no, nobody ever sat down and made a child read or read to them a Taoist text. Uh, the Taoist priest, of course, was not a preacher. The Taoist priest was rather like your, you know, local doctor. If something was wrong, you went to him and paying him a fee, he would try to do something to solve your problem. But just like my doctor, he did not take the time to explain to you what he was doing or why. Uh, if you wanted to know that, you might have to pay a lar quite a bit larger fee. Uh, Michael Sasso, who actually was, uh, you know, on the one hand, a, a Jesuit priest and then a Taoist priest, I think he told me, that his in, uh, training in Taoism cost him about 10,000 US dollars, uh, you know. So it was not a religion in the sense that was missionary. Uh, and it seemed to me what struck me as sort of attractive is that it was a religion in, you know, there's. There might be some question of whether you want to call it a religion. I, that doesn't seem to me a very interesting question. But you have to say that early missionaries coming to China and saying there really wasn't any religion didn't have a point. I mean, if you're thinking of Christianity uh, and so forth, this doesn't look much like religion. Uh, it was really a set of beliefs that allowed people some kind of solution to problems that they couldn't otherwise deal with. Uh, my clearest picture of this came from, there was a, a, a shaman, a, a dangi, who came uh, every, uh, once a week, I think on Thursdays, not to the village that I was living in, but one nearby, and uh, people came to him, and he sort of held like a clinic. I mean, he, <laughs> it, it wasn't, uh, there, wa there wasn't much ritual involved, but he did go into trance and so forth, and people came and brought him his problems. And what kind of problems they did? I collected, actually, I think I have about 300 such cases, and that's one of the things I should write up one of these days. Uh, the men who came were mostly coming with problems about their pigs. Uh, you know, the sow was expected to litter and hadn't, and there was a problem. Or there was a pig sick, or should I sell my pigs now? Is the price going to go up, or is it going to go down? Uh, the women who came had problems, you know, my husband is wasting all the family's budget on prostitutes. Uh, my daughter-in-law won't listen to me. One of the most surprising things to me is I think I, at least three instances in which women came with their teenage daughters. Uh, and they apparently were embarrassed to tell their teenage daughters about menstruation. So they brought 
turns to the god. This shaman had obviously seen that again and again. He knew immediately what the situation was. His response was he would laugh and say, look, this happens to all girls at this time of life. Uh, you know, take this who and burn it and put it in tea and take two aspirins and you'll be fine. But, you know, a religion in which one of the functions of gods is to tell young women that they've reached the point that they're beginning to menstruate. Uh, you know, Catholic priests don't do this. Uh, uh, it's, this is a, it's so mundane, it is so practical, it is, uh, there is nothing here of the ideological, oppressive, authoritarian, as I see it, nature of the great religions. And I'm not speaking just of Christianity. Confucianism, if anything, is somewhat worse. Uh, Islam most certainly is. Uh, Buddhism can take that turn. Uh, it's, it's when religion gets institutionalized, when it gets, when you get religious specialists, then it turns into a, a different kind of thing and something that I do not find attractive. So part of the reasons I wrote God's Ghosts and Ancestors was I was, I like to Uh The other thing is I'm always, uh, I have my own uh, to Deco. People, people were very quick, they picked up on this, and when, when I left the village after two and a half years, one of the things they gave me was a, a stone to go, you know, whose eyes had been opened, and you know, he's the master of California now. Uh, uh, so it's, it is that something that I do not see, and I'm not current with all that's being written about Taiwan religion, but I do not see sort of yet this characterization of it as a set of beliefs, a set of very human activities, and so <laughs> forth, that doesn't have an ideology. Uh, that it remains at the level of a, being a very human uh, set of activities. Why didn't I continue uh, with religion if I found it Taiwanese religion attractive? Well, there are various reasons. Uh, one thing uh, is I discovered other things that, uh, but most importantly, I didn't know where to go with it. I have a intellectual bent, uh, perhaps because of, you know, background training in philosophy and psychology, but whatever is the question I would really want to ask is why are some people religious? What does this tell us about human nature? That is that is the question that if I have seen a, a path to address that question, to bring somehow conclusive kind of data on it. If I even had a strong hypothesis, but I didn't. And that was part of the reason that I didn't continue. The other more important reasons that I did see, uh, you know, rather, thank goodness, a, another opportunity in which I could address that kind of question. And this is the, what I call minor marriages, the Shimbua, the Tongyangshi, etc. And I saw the possibility that you had a natural experiment in Taiwan in which you had two forms of marriage, one in which the couple didn't actually meet until the day of their marriage, which was more or less the case among the, certainly the older people in the first village I worked in, and the other day in the form of marriage in which they were reared together from early childhood. And here was the question that the Finnish philosopher, sociologist, anthropologist, and Edward Westermark had debated with Sigmund and Freud. Lost the debate, but not because Freud had any very good evidence. And a question that was, you know, certainly a, a very traditional question. A question that always lacked very strong evidence because you could never sort out. The only people who were typically reared together are brother and sister. 
and they're under the restrictions of the incest taboo. So if they avoid one another, you don't know whether it's because they've been reared together or because they're simply obeying the rule of the incest taboo. Here in Taiwan, you had a form of marriage in which the couple were reared together and not only not, they were in more or less forced to marry. Uh, many resisted it. Uh, the, you know, the marriage ceremony for a minor marriage was typically held on the uh, eve of the Chinese Lunar New Year because you didn't have to invite guests then. You closed up the house and everybody came home. Most older people refer, refer to that as uh, they they were speaking to his marriage. They were just being pushed together. Well, I saw that opportunity, but that was n the Westermark hypothesis, as it generally called, was not a popular hypothesis at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, a f at a fairly large meeting at the Center for Advanced Studies at Stanford, a group, a very senior group of anthropologists, psychologists, and biologists had summed up what we knew about the incest taboo and then said that they mentioned Edward Westermark only for the sake of completeness. So, although when I returned to the States, I wrote a paper about this, and because it's an attractive st subject, it was published, but nobody was convinced. And I, I learned about the Taiwan household registers, and I saw the possibility to compare the two forms of marriage in terms of fertility, the frequency of divorce, of adultery. And that I have continued to do right down to almost to this very day. I now work with a sample of approximately 25,000 marriages. Uh, nobody can sort of challenge the data as in terms of its, of its quantity anymore. At any rate, that's what took me, in some sense, away from religion, and also uh, that I do feel somewhat away from my work with child training. Uh, it, uh, and I, you know, went from uh, incest using demographic data to test the Westermark hypothesis, then getting interested in the demographic data per se. So now I mostly publish actually in, in demography journals. <laughs> Let me just speculate, if I may, uh, or ruminate would perhaps be a better word, on what I might do, uh, what I would say you might consider, uh, going back to religion, not as ethnographers. I mean, you do that too, you do it all. Uh, but asking the question, you know, why are, are human beings uh, inclined? Not all of them. Uh, and the religions that we call religions take many different forms, but it seems almost a human universal. We have a wonderful sort of natural experiment in mainland China that, much to my disgust, nobody is taking any advantage of. Religion in many parts of the mainland was similar quite similar to what you would find in Taiwan. The 1949 revolution, the government made a very determined effort to wipe it out. And, you know, temples were closed, destroyed, and, and villages in North China, you could find, you know, the bricks around. They were being used to, they built pig pens and whatever. And if you were going to advance through the ranks of the Chinese Communist Party, you had to leave religion behind. Uh, that was uh, going to mark you as a capitalist rooter for sure. Now that effort, you know, perhaps wasn't entirely successful, but it went on for the better part of 30 years. And why I say this is an interesting natural experiment is no sooner does the government begin to loosen up and popular religion is back, back all over the country. What does that say? Maybe it's just that, you know, the Chinese communist regime uh, wasn't, they were pretty damned effective. Their birth control shows that. The fact that they were able to completely reorganize rural China says that this was an incredibly powerful, successive, effective government. But they didn't manage to stamp out religion. And 
What seems to me interesting about that is it says something about a, what do we call it, a human need or something that this should come back so quickly. Maybe gradually, etc. But it, the, uh, at any rate, that, that is one of the things I think people should be looking at. Just a thought about what we are looking at when we're looking at religion. And this comes from a, from a very different source than is likely to be something that people here will read. Uh, you, you have to understand, I, I'm, I'm not really an anthropologist. I'm not really anything. Uh, I was trained in the Joint Department of Sociology and Anthropology. My first appointment was a joint appointment in Anthropology and Psychology. When I moved to Stanford, I taught the Anthropology Department, but gradually moved to the Human uh, Biology Program. So my actually title at Stanford, I have a chair, but I am the uh, David and Lucille Packard Professor of Human Biology, not, not Anthropology. Uh, but that explains why I might be reading things like this. And I'm rethinking of an article by a very fine uh, American physiolog physiologist, man whom I think probably is quite a few years deceased, by the name of Donald Hebb. And he has an essay, actually in a handbook of social psychology, uh, and the essay is entitled The Social Significance of Animal Studies, an unlikely place to be looking for anything relevant to religion. But in that, Hebb, taking the point of view of comparing our species with other species, makes a very interesting and, to my mind, powerful generalization. He says, you know, we all know there's plenty of evidence that you know, Homo sapiens is just a great deal smarter than any other species, even that our closest relatives, chimpanzees, bonobos, and the like, certainly much more so than any of the other mammals. But he says that's only one of the ways in which we very importantly differ from most other animals. We are also the most emotional of all animals. Uh, we respond with more emotionality to uh, many situations than other animals. Uh, you know, dogs don't get upset by seeing a dead dog. Uh, I grew up on a ranch. Uh, it, it kind of upsets the other cows when you shoot one of them and butcher them there, but not much. Uh, but human beings get, you know, with the amount of ritualization and cultural effort that's put into funerals and dead bodies and cemeteries and so forth is enormous. Hebb makes this point very powerfully, to my mind at least, this way. He said, most of the time we don't see how emotional we are because so much of culture is constructed to protect us from our own emotionality. What we can't stand is to get into situations in which things are not quite predictable. We like low levels of emotionality. You know, keep it on the television, keep it in the sports stadium, you know, under rules with referees and so forth. But when it gets a bit out of hand, we get a bit out of hand. And he, he argues that many of the things that we just sort of seem so natural to us are to give us the sense that everything's all right, everything's predictable. We care a great deal about how people say good morning and good night. Well, we care a great deal when hair fashions change. I mean, you know, how much fuss in the United States when uh, a group of young people called hippies started, men started wearing their hair down to the shoulder length. It's all right now, it's past. Uh, you know, even football players and so forth wear their hair hair at sho shoulder length. But changes like that and so forth we find very bothersome. And I suspect that at the root of human religiousosity, if one could call it that, is human emotionality. 
religion is all about at least religion when we of the kind that we find in popular religion. When it gets to be the ideology of a church, I mean the Catholic Church owned about the roughly half of Europe. Uh, this this was a state. Uh, this was uh, you know. Once it gets into the hands of professionals and a bureaucratic organization, then religion becomes a very different thing. But when religion remains at sort of the popular human level, it is probably a response to the human discomfort uh, with f almost fear of lack of predictability the desire for a certain amount of control. At any rate, that is something that, uh, you know, were I to go back to that, uh, I would seriously think about and try to, you know, it's an interesting hypothesis, but, you know, an enormous amount of work has to be to specify it and so forth. And then to think of how, uh, how you can some sense, you know, really confirm it. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, in my work with incest that I have gotten up to 25,000 cases is I'm very uncomfortable working with data that is not independent of me. Data that is not capable of standing up and saying, Professor Wolf, that's a good hypothesis, but it's wrong. <laughs> And if you have, you know, quantitative data like frequency of divorce and fertility and that kind of thing, you run it through the computer and, you know, it's uh, fairly anxiety producing as to uh, what's going to happen. And uh, one of sort of the, the joys of my research with incest is that every test has worked, or almost every test. Uh, so that I have what the uh, historian of science, uh, William Huell, called a consilience of inductions, which is you take different kinds of evidence. In my case, fertility, divorce, adultery, the frequency of polygyny, very different kinds of things. They all predict the differences between what I call major and minor marriages. When those four inductions all come to the same point, then that is the point, Huell would say, where truth lies. And so this is it. When one begins to insist uh, on evidence that uh, is capable of telling you you're on the wrong track. Uh, it gets very difficult to think how to do that. It's actually usually easier to think of good hypotheses than it is to, to test them. Let me conclude just by making two points, and I, I hope these don't offend anybody here. They're likely to friend my dear friend over here, but she's used to it. Uh, <laughs> the first is that I have to express a certain dissatisfaction with a good deal of work in Chinese studies and work with Taiwanese religion. Uh, and that is that while enormous amount of good work has been done, the papers and books stack up, but they don't add up. Nobody is telling us what it is the study of Taiwanese religion is telling us about human beings. There are so far no generalizations. And this, this matters not only from an intellectual standpoint, but this matters in a sense from a larger academic point because if the study of Taiwanese religion remains very specific to the content of Taiwanese religion, nobody in Scotland is going to take an interest. They might be very interested in religion, but they're not going to be interested in Taiwanese religion per se, and why should they, in a sense? Unless they have a hypothesis that they might use your data. But you have got to do something to get 
the research to add it, to address larger questions about society, about human nature, about whatever. Sorry, that sounds a bit, uh, that's a bit preachy. Uh, <laughs> but you, you have to excuse me. I'll make one last point, though. And this is sort of by way of trying to counter a popular, popular at least in anthropology, stereotype. If you count things, if you ask questions, if you really want to say, you know, what is human nature really like, uh, then you, you know, uh, you're a sociobiologist, and that's very bad, you know. I've been accused of that. When I first read my papers and so forth with regard to incest, I was accused by people in my own department and publicly of not only being a male chauvinist, but of being a Nazi. Because I was suggesting that a certain important part of human behavior probably had its origins in a, the biology, the danger of inbreeding. Uh, and that, was, that is simply not acceptable. So it's countering that that I say this about the study of religion. There's a sense in which the study of religion, there's a great danger there. Because if you're a extreme relativist, like most of the postmodernists, uh, and then religion is your best evidence. You think it this way, if you look across human societies, and this is where I come back to my point, look at mundane behavior. Look at the, what the children are doing. Look at the women when they're cooking dinner. Look at the men when they're working in the fields. And the differences across human societies are not very great. It's when you get into religion and ideology and ritual, and if you concentrate on that, you can make any society look like, where did this come from? What other planet? These must be totally different kinds of human beings. And what is some people would speak of, of celebrating diversity, I see as denying humanity. And insofar as you provide evidence for relativists and so forth, you are not a humanist. The goal of anthropology is to, in a sense, to demonstrate beyond any reasonable doubt that there is a fundamental humanity that human beings, wherever they live and what time and so forth, uh, you know, have a great deal in common. They live under very different circumstances and that makes a difference. They live under very different political regimes and that makes a difference. But I think the task of anthropology is to demonstrate that they are not totally different. And anyone who doubts that has to think of just what it is that anthropology has done. Anthropologists over the past hundred years have gone to every human society that they possibly had access to, and they all came back, or practically all of them. They didn't die of some uh, local disease. They were to some degree accepted as human beings. Lauriston Sharp studied this people the year you run. They had never seen a, a Caucasian before. And they didn't, you know, he didn't speak year you run when he got there. They don't teach year you run at Harvard. Uh, he had to learn a kind of pigeon and gradually work his way up the Cape York Peninsula until he got among the year you run. And then he created for them an enormous problem because year you run society is totally organized in terms of kinship. There's no category of stranger, let alone anthropologist, or priest, or policeman, or anything of the sort. You're a mother's brother, or you're this or that, and that's it. And all behavior is defined in terms of how you behave to certain other people. You avoid them, uh, you give them the best part of the, the wallaby you just caught, or whatever it is. And here is this strange-looking being coming, and what is he? He's nobody mother-brother. 
the wonderful story Sharp tells is that at one point, when most of the band that he was with was together in an evening, an old man who was generally respected as more knowledgeable than most came up very deliberately to Sharp and said, you are my son. Then he had a mother's brother. There were women he had to avoid. There were women if he wanted to, he could have slept with. I mean, it all fell into place. Now that is enormous insight. And that is, you know, one of the sort of furthest out of all the societies, the Australian Aborigines, one of the quote unquote most primitive societies anthropologists have ever studied. But here is a man who sees that this other being is also a human being, that he has, he has an insight into the whole social situation. And he's also, he's not all bound up in his culture and unable to see beyond it. Maybe some people were, but not all were. At any rate, uh, what I, you know, somewhat provocatively, and I admit the, the provocation, call the dangers of religion is that it is so tempting to make human beings look tremendously different from one another if you focus on religion. If you focus on other things, like, you know, this was not my purpose, but the study of child training, they don't look that different. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that the study of religion and so forth has got to be pushed back down. Religion is a kind of human behavior. And we have to do more to try to understand why there is such behavior. And I think we best understand it and so forth by studying religions like Taiwanese folk religion. Not, not Taoist text. Not the Christian church, the hierarchy. I'm, after all, I, I'm a bit of a Marxist, and you know, the whole purpose, of course you will find all kinds of mysteries if you dig deep enough into Taoism or deep enough into Christianity or Islam. That's the whole purpose. The purpose of those ideologies is to mystify. Uh, and by controlling those myst you know, those myst that mystic knowledge to control other people. But if you focus on the mundane religions that you would find in, say, a hunter-gatherer society, but fortunately you still find in many other societies, and you find in Taiwan in the form of folk religion, uh, you get closer to something that is not been, as it were, professionalized, and therefore removed uh, a long ways from human behavior. You'll never find the common core of religion. And, you know, I, I, I can't help but think my office is just around the corner, the Stanford Quad from the Department of Religious Studies, and you can imagine what they think of me. Um, but you're never going to get the core of what it is that is human about religion by studying texts. You have to study the behavior of very average people. Thank you, Professor Arthur. Maybe that you are not looking uh, for religion in Taiwan from within, but from a higher point of view, so that you can lay down a simple but very clear framework to explain folk religion in Taiwan. And this is a teaching for us. And I thought we could have one or two questions, but could we? OK. Mm -hmm. We just take one or two questions because the time is that. <laughs> he was one of my students. Uh, the reason he's saying that. Uh. <laughs>
In, in a sense, though I don't make it explicit, this is what I was doing in God's Ghosts and Ancestors. If you're going to conceive of a supernatural that is powerful, and you're a Chinese peasant, who is it around who's powerful? It's the imperial bureaucracy. That's the image of power. And so you conceive of that. Who is it that's dangerous? It's the, you know, the people, you know, over on the other side of the river, the other lineage with whom you're fighting with over control of the marketplace. Who are the people to whom you're indebted and you're respected? It's your own, you know, forebears. Uh, so, people in a sense, if they are going to imagine powers outside of themselves, are going to turn to the examples that are in front of them in their society. Uh, now, that generalization, but it, that's one of the attractions for me to popular religion. I think that generalization would be a pointing start to compare popular religion. Once it gets into the hands of the professionals, the Jesuits and the Taoists and so forth, they're going to invent all kinds of things uh, that basically underwrite their power. And they're going to have nothing to do. They're, you know, they are, they're creators uh, quite self-consciously of religion. You know, I, I don't know how to answer that's in some sense part of the task. Uh, I would look at the diversity you recommend and look at it as, in a sense, the leverage to address the problem. <laughs> and, you know, my research question would begin, why people here and not these people over here? Uh, what is the difference in their history, their economic, social circumstances, whatever? Uh, You know, your basic assumption is that people will think about power, you know, in relation to, well, the kinds of social relations they have with people on the ground. 
So then it seems like the obvious place to start looking for, you know, explanations for differences in how they think about it is to look at the social relations on the ground. So for me, for instance, it's not, you know, Arthur's own case. He's living with a bunch of ranchers and loggers out in the back of the beyond. People who I bet are fiercely independent, proud of being fiercely independent. They don't take shit from anybody. And that includes God. <laughs> Whereas you move into town, hey, the town guys, you know, they probably have a mayor, they probably have a city council, you know, but at any rate, they have a more structured sort of society where, where the experience of power is a very different thing. Now, we don't know that because you'd have to dig a lot deeper, but, it, but certainly it, you know, to look at the actual sort of social relations and then in, in the old-fashioned way that Bit Turner used to talk about, look at the material conditions that shapes the relationships. Again, you know, Don de Gopper's thing. You know, why do you have all those temples in Lugong, not so many in Erlin, both towns the same size, in, you know, both in the John Hall Plain? You can't understand that unless you understand that Lugong was once a flourishing port in a much bigger city that is sort of folded in on itself. Yeah, right. Yeah, but anyway. I just glancing at my notes, there's one point that I would like very briefly to mention. I think it's revealing about the nature of Taiwanese folk religion. I think it's a something that I hope someone would address. And that is the manifestations of religion among children. That Taiwanese folk religion doesn't have an ideology is clearly evident, and nobody makes any effort to teach it to children. Children are there. They're not excluded. They pick it up, and my child's observations, every once in a while, uh, you know, a child will want something. They really wanted to go on a school trip and were afraid it would rain. So they went to the Tudigong and made a little offering to get Tudigong to, you know, so we get to go on the school trip. So they know about it. They pick it up, but nobody is concerned to teach it. Nobody, this is proper behavior. This is what you really ought to believe. And it would, this is sort of almost a sign that we're dealing in popular religion with something very different than when we're dealing with institutionalized religion. Hmm. We'll take, we'll have to take it out there. I've got a counter case for this. <laughs> I'm negotiating a few seconds. <laughs> so I heard your message, and um, I don't want to play it down, but um, I w was hoping also that you would say uh, a few words about the metaphor, <laughs> God, God, and ancestors. Uh, I will not torture you and ask you to assess it after <laughs> how many years now? 30, 40, I don't know. Okay. Um, but just how did you get into um, the observations of the facts you were referring to in, in this paper that was so influential and launched the discussion actually with, uh, for many people? Did but I write at those metaphors? Sorry? Yeah. No, uh, what made you uh, switching from, I don't know, observation of uh, children's behavior to observe, I start observing around you, uh, around yourself, what was going on also with uh, uh, religious practices regarding uh, ancestor worship, gods, and uh, ghosts. You know, I was How did you build that reasons. hypothesis? You know, I was trained in a classic anthropology department. Uh, I was way out on a limb as far as most of my teachers by focusing on quantitative observations of children to study. You know, William Lambert was happy to have me do it, the psychologist, but not my anthropology professor. They expected you to do, and I inclined to do, to create the context to do general ethnography. Remember, this was a time that there was nothing in English language, certainly about Taiwanese religion, and very little about Chinese folk religion. And then also, uh, you know, although I get uh, sometimes characterized in a sense as a, you know, 
a reductionist. I am a reductionist. That's the purpose. But I am also trained in, in English literature. And one of the things that attracted me was the possibility of writing that paper. I, I write sometimes for the sake of writing. Uh, I look for topics to write about. Uh, and I would say to younger people here, if you don't like to write, don't stay in anthropology. The greater part of the people who fail in this field, they don't fail because they're not very bright. They fail because they can't sit themselves down and write. And so, you know, partly this, this was a, an exercise. I wrote God's Ghosts and Ancestors rather than writing a short story. <laughs> Thank you.